everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm Robert Perry Cruz, your host, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hello, Rob. It's me, Jackie. Is It's like a Muppet version of Jackie, kind of with that voice? Sure. It sounded like it's a whole hey. I guess I'm Muppety. It's pretty good. And it's me, Diana. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> That's a, Man, this segue is getting rough. Yeah, yeah, Good yeah. thing this is not a podcast about how to uh, begin a podcast. It's actually a podcast about behavior analysis and a behavior analytic research. Every week, we pick a topic, discuss some relevant research articles, and sometimes we even do fun little extras within our episodes. And this is one of those episodes. So let's let's cut to the chase and get right to it. We had a great opportunity this summer to meet and interact with some folks from How to ABA, and we have them on tonight on this episode to talk with us all about ethics and common ethical questions new BCBAs and BCBA trainees often have. So we are very, very excited to have Shana Gaunt and Shira Carpell from How to ABA with us today. Shana and Shira, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Oh, boy. Well, we're very excited we got a chance to to come on your show. I know I had audio tech technical issues, so no one had to listen to me very much. And uh, this episode, we're very lucky to have you both on uh, to talk about some questions. You got some questions from folks, you know, fr- from some of your folks about ethics, and we're going to be talking about them and some updated kind of ethics articles we think are good ones to share. And that's really going to be it. So it's going to be a little bit of a Q&A. We usually do Q&A with our guests, but this one's going to be very question and then general discussion of answers oriented all about ethics and some kind of initial ethical thoughts for folks out there and some questions that come up for practitioners. Ethical thoughts is pretty funny. Ethical, maybe we should just call that. That's the episode. Ethical <laughs> thoughts <laughs> with how to ABA. Remember that with Jack Handy? Remember that? That's deep thoughts though. Yeah, I know. Oh, That's deep. We got to do all this deep ethical deep thoughts. Thought, deep now ethical thoughts. I That's, like how, That's how the episode titles, they, they get created. These great discussions. <laughs> so, All right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We love this topic because usually we're the ones hosting, you know, our members asking us questions. So mm-hmm. I think when we spoke about what we would talk about, it'd be interesting for us to get questions from you representing what some of our members struggle with really in the field, which is what we do within our membership is support our members and the people who are really struggling with a lot of these scenarios that are real practical, you know, day to day stuff that that come up. So we thought it would be cool to showcase it here. That sounds awesome. Well, actually, before we talk about uh, some of the articles and get into the questions, Shane and Shira, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how to a- yourselves and how to ABA? Sure. I'm Shana. I've been in the field for, gosh, 25 years now. I can't even believe it. Started off as a therapist and loved it so much. Then I became, you know, I was one of the very first BCBAs in Canada. And uh, it was a BCABA first and then a BCBA. And uh, met Shira about 15 years ago. And it's been that long, Shira. Mm -hmm. And we established How to ABA back in 2017 already. Because when we started out in the field, nobody was sharing anything. Everything seemed really like, this is my stuff. And I created it and I worked so hard on it. And I own it and I don't want to share with anybody else. And, you know, we came across a lot of people with questions and, you know, just a lot of people who wanted a community. So that's how we created How to ABA. And I'll go next. I'm Shira. I actually first became a teacher, which I said I would never become. And then I taught for a couple years and was really looking for this solution that ABA kind of fell into my lap because I I was always kind of trying to figure out the students who didn't really quite fit in. So I ended up falling into ABA and met Shana, became a BCBA. I've been a BCBA for a little over 10 years. I work now as the clinical director of a private special education school. And I'm the other half of How to ABA, like Shana said, where we offer resources, support, community, and everything practical for like the working BCBA. So, And Shira, you're also in Canada, right? Yeah. Or, okay, so you're both in Canada. Could Jealous. You- Could you speak a little bit about what it's like to be a BCBA in Canada? I mean, in terms of, you know, talking with colleagues down in the U.S., does it seem very similar? Does it seem 
very different? Like, kind of what what is the status? Because I mean, we're in Massachusetts, so Canada doesn't feel it's like an eight hour drive if we want to go to uh, you know Quebec City or something, you know Toronto. So it, it feels like Canada is incredibly close. But, you know, we know that we, we don't want to just assume like, OK, it's just like America because, you know, they're different countries with different backgrounds and histories. Well, yeah. we don't live in an igloo and we don't have a dog sled. We do have ABA in Canada. There are a lot of BCBAs. I actually did my education through the University of Nevada, Reno, and I worked in New Jersey for a while. So I can compare Canada to the U.S. quite closely. I would say when I worked in New Jersey back in 2000-ish, it was about 10 to 15 years ahead of where Canada was. I would say now Canada's caught up quite significantly. I think the major difference would be the funding model. So we don't right. have the insurance companies like the U.S. does. Which is a good thing and a bad thing, right? We kind of practice the science for the science. And so we're able to make decisions based on our ethical code and our task list and not as much based on insurance funding. Is it... In the public schools? No. Okay. So it's, Yeah, it's, oh. they still separate ABA from the school system. That's why I get to work in a private school, which, you know, we get to really merge the two, which is really nice. In public schools, it's still a little bit sticky in terms of them letting ABA practitioners into the public school and actually providing ABA in the school system. We're a little bit behind. Okay. Is it any, any kind of sense of, of what some of the barriers are? Like it's a teacher teacher organization issue or just the way laws have been structured. That really just bureaucratic. Yeah. yeah. It's there, you know, different ministries that fund different services. And right now the funding is for, if you have a diagnosis of autism, you can be eligible for a pretty significant amount of funding, but that funding is very specific and it's very specific to the point where you can't even use it on school. They really want it to be used on therapies, you know, all of those things so that they really purposefully separate the two probably more for like legal reasons. Okay. Well, thank not you. Not in the best interest oh. of the kids, which is which yeah. is what I love to talk about because, like, I get to do both. So, yeah, I think it should be for education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that that can, could lead into some ethical discussions in terms okay. of you can <laughs> provide ABA services for educational needs, but can you in certain situations? When is it legal? When is it ethical? But maybe we'll get into that one a little later because you have to have a role, all that good stuff. Well, thank you for the update from up north, at least from where we're recording right now. It's always nice to hear more about <laughs> other places and ABA in other locations. So with some introductions done, let's share kind of the articles we'll sort of be referring back and forth to, and then we'll get right into the questions for today. Yeah. So like we had said, the most important part of this discussion today is really going to be surrounding the BACB ethics code. We're going to talk about some common situations that crop up according to the how to ABA listeners. And when you hear the scenarios, you'll be like, oh yeah, those are like definitely situations that either you've personally experienced or someone else you know has. But I wanted to make sure that we were tying things back into the literature as well. So I chose a few articles to kind of support our discussion. And the one that I think is most relevant would be this one, disseminating ethical applied behavior analysis within a human service organization, a tutorial by Gladowski, Hockenberry, Anthony, and Hinckley. That was published in Behavior Analysis in Practice 2024. It's pretty new. It has some colorful diagrams included. It's really pretty. It is, right? It's a pretty yeah. article. And then to round that out, I, I listed three in the preview, but really I think these two are the ones that are, are germane to the discussion. So the other one is, a preliminary assessment of the qualities and behaviors of exemplary practitioners, perspectives from U.S.-based behavior analysts. That's by Zayak, Van Stratton, Ratkos, Williams, Geiger, and Pauk. And that was in Behavior Analysis and Practice 2021. I love that one. <laughs> one of my a, I had not read or come across this article before this go-round. Mm -hmm. And I loved it, too. I thought it was really cool. But I included it as well. I'll just go ahead and, like, briefly talk about it here. So they asked several BCBAs, basically, what are important characteristics to have as a BCBA? And this, you know, austere group of folks came up with like 35 different skills or characteristics that they felt are important to be successful as a BCBA. And I'm going to quickly 
it, it run, and they alphabetize them. So like, I love that, mm-hmm. right? But I'm going to quickly tell you what some of them are. Being able to advocate for a- ABA, all the seven dimensions. Make sure you can do all of those. Be child centered. Be collaborative. Be culturally competent. Be data driven. Disseminate information. Be an effective communicator. Be an effective instructor. Be efficient and organized. Be empathetic. Be ethical. Be experienced. Be flexible. Be honest. Be humble. Be innovative. Have interpersonal skills and knowledgeable. And that's just the first half of the alphabet. That so. was really good. That's a very <laughs> high standard for us. <laughs> right? I know. That's the thing, right? And and it's true. Like everything on this list, I totally agree with. But I also feel like as a brand new BCBA, you come in and Let's say you got this list, right? And you're like, this is what I need to be. I need to be all of these things at once. And you're trying to learn how to do all of this at the same time while you're managing a caseload and maybe starting to supervise people and running parent meetings. And there's just so much going on there. So I feel like it can be so easy to get overwhelmed, even though I agree with the list. It's just a lot. So I think recognizing that folks have big shoes that they see themselves needing to fill and how that can potentially contribute towards the stress of making some of these initial decisions, whether they're in the ethics realm or in just the realm of, of trying to learn how to do this really complex job. Well, I mean, a caveat for new BCBAs who see this list and say, I got to do all of these if I want to be exemplary. No, you know, this list, not everyone rated all of these high. (laughs) So there's only like 10 to 20 you got to do. Maybe 15 you could get away with and still be considered exemplary. Plus, they only asked other BCBAs. And as much fun as it is is to have other BCBAs think you're awesome at your job, at the end of the day, it's really your clients and their caregivers who matter the most. And I don't think they talk about doing that as a follow-up study. They have not done that study. So for all we know, you could be awesome at the top 10 things other BCBAs think, and nobody else thinks you are uh, all that. Yeah. So I think the one that I liked in the the top 10 actually was the one that was strives to be a better behavior analyst. Because I think if you can get that one, then you don't have to have all the other ones. And I think it's actually, we also ask a lot of our guests on our podcast, what would you recommend or, you know, a newly minted BCBA? And most of the time it has to do with that. It's like, just continue to grow, continue to try and be better. Because if you have that, then eventually, you know, you may not start out being super efficient, but you'll learn that. And I think that's a really important skill. Totally. And then speaking of generality of the study, it was only U.S. based behavior. So we, you know, we have no idea might be different up here. Yeah. Be, right, exactly. <laughs> so it's ripe for replication. I, I was a little sad that one of the least important skills was being able to disseminate behavior analysis, which is like, man, I just spent eight years oppressing <laughs> no one, I guess. So a little sad for that. The interesting thing, though, they did say effective communicator and interpersonal skills. So, you know, Rob, if you want to take that one, like number 10, effective communicator, take that one instead. Okay. Then there, to December. All right. <laughs> you got you talk, it. You talked me down. You talked me down, Shana. Thank you. <laughs> oh, good. All right. So this big, long list. Don't worry. You don't have to do a ball. We'll talk about some of the ones that, that, you know, we talked about some of the ones we liked a little later. All right. So. These were questions that were sent in from the How to ABA listeners. So we're just going to get started with number one. Can we ask what, what exactly oh, was yeah. the prompt? That what was, was the given? prompt? What yeah. was the prompt? Good, uh, good idea. Oh, it was probably something like, tell us about your everyday ethical challenges. Mm. There you go. It's a good prompt. It's a good prompt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's how, actually, that's how I start my ethics class every week. Oh. What sort of, what sort of ethical challenges or successes have you have you come up with? And it is interesting what you can hear. And I'm like, please we, don't tell me the company. <laughs> <laughs> we have a monthly mentorship meeting, and uh, we start off every meeting with, tell us about your successes of the week. But we should also start talking about ethics because they're huge. We got a lot of responses and almost immediate responses from our members. Oh, it's yeah. something that you know, it's talked about in articles, but a lot of it has to do with supervision and my supervisor, supervisee. And these are more practical related things like, well, in my workplace, this is what's happening. And like you said, please don't tell me where you work, but let's talk about this. You know, I, I also like to bring up the point that it is part of the ethics code to talk about ethics during supervision. Right. So Mm -hmm. we should be talking about ethics in all of our supervision meetings, if we can, at least monthly. So if you are a supervisor and you're engaging in individual or group supervision, 
you should be including a question about ethics, either learning about ethics or discussing ethics in every single one of your, or, or, you know, as many as you can of your supervision meetings, as it is part of the ethical requirement to being a good supervisor. So I, I want actually want to start get rid of question one. I, I'm asking question one here for everybody. How do you prep your trainees or supervisees to talk fluently about ethical problems? Because one of the challenges I used to find, I think I've come up with some solutions that have worked for me over the years for, for folks I supervise. But one of the problems is when we talk about ethics with people who are new to the field, I think it becomes very much, well, I didn't like push anyone in front of a car or like steal money. So I don't have any ethical concerns this week. And it takes such a long time to get to really breaking down how easy it is. I think it was. No, no, no. Even, yeah. even then you could be talking about the trolley problem. <laughs> that's, that's true. But, but what do folks do to sort of get people sort of primed to have more meaningful discussion? Not that it's not meaningful to, you know, literally do no harm, but to really have some of those more complex ethical discussions or to teach your supervisees and trainees how to even identify the more subtle ethical breaches? I think that's a great question. It's something that I definitely have to be more, you know, aware of because it should come up more often in terms of like, let's talk about it again and let tell me what you've experienced. What I try to do sometimes is the modeling. Like I'll talk about something that I've been experiencing in some of our meetings or something that's come up for me. Then it's always a fine line of like, how much do you tell your supervisee and how much do you not? But I think just talking about things as they're coming up because it's not a, it's not an intuitive awareness. You're kind of making them aware of what they need to be aware of, which comes from, I think a lot of just hearing it and talking about it and modeling it for, for me. And so that eventually they start to see it in their everyday. The other thing too, would be to normalize it. So, you know, yeah. ethical challenges aren't supposed to be a slap on the wrist. I mean, obviously if you've broken the code, you, there's repercussions, but being able to talk about something that came up doesn't mean that you did the wrong thing. There's, you know, lots of ways. It's like, hey, let's talk about this so that you don't do the wrong thing. And really being able to normalize it and saying, you know, everyone goes through this. Everyone has ethical dilemmas at work. You wouldn't be a behavior analyst or an ABA professional if you weren't experiencing some of these things. I, I like both of those ideas. Certainly, the modeling it, the talking about your own your own background, uh, and trying to normalizing the discussions. I think is great. Uh, Jack, you're dying. Anything else? One thing that I do is each. So I print them off for everyone first and foremost, so that everyone has them, <laughs> right? So they you can't the be code? like, I yeah, I print the code off, and then for you know, in my class, it's part of class, right? So we have lots of you know, scenarios that we will walk through that may or may not be real that I've found from like the Arizona ABA has an ethics archive. Their association has an ethic archive. Behavior analysis and practice has an ethics archive where there are scenarios. So I can use some of those scenarios. A lot of the ethics textbooks have scenarios that we would pull out. But another thing I love to do is have a, when I'm doing group supervision, I will have like a standards month. So I'll have like the students just focus on one standard, like standard one. And then each week we'll be like, okay, anything happened in standard one. <laughs> and then, you know, they'll, a lot of the times it's deciphering if it's an ethical issue, if it's like just an icky issue, right? Maybe it's not ethical, but it feels icky or if it's a legal issue. So guy kind of going through that and everyone has to come up with something, even if it's like, I thought about accepting a Starbucks gift card that was $11, right? And like, where do you go there, right? Because we're only allowed to accept $10. The $11 yes. gift card. The $11 gift card, right? That's, that that's, sounds that's, like an ethics trap. Like, well, they're, as a they're, Canadian, they're to am I allowed to accept a $10 US gift card or only a $10 Canadian gift card? Oh, you know, it'll geez. really depend on the currency level at that time, right? What's ethical today could not be ethical tomorrow <laughs> based right. on inflation. You know? uh, but that, you know, it's like those things that will just focus on a standard for a month. And that really allows students or and, and, and supervisees to really like kind of really like dig deep and ask all of the what they think are dumb questions, which are absolutely not dumb questions about those standards. Smart. I think that's such a great idea also, because when we learn about ethics from the code, you think of it in like hard, like black and white 
terrible things are happening. So obviously, like, I'm going to report that because somebody is like, you know, doing something terrible. But when you talk about it more, it's really just the nuanced things. It's like, yeah. it's not yeah. so clear that this is obviously an ethical rule because there's so much gray in between like what is ethical. And so I think having the discussions maybe around a certain topic really bring up those ideas that like the code makes it sound like extreme, like it either is ethical or it's not. But in real life practice, it's it's about those little, you know, nuance. And the, the last thing I want to say, I'm sorry, the last thing I want to say is that the 2022 code, I think, does a better job uh, than the previous codes of making it not feel like everybody's going to jail, right? If you do something right. wrong or you're instantly going to lose your, right, you're instantly going to lose your BACB certification if you've, if you've taken that $11 gift card because they offer that flow chart in the introduction now. And they do specifically say that there are times where you will have to violate the code, but if you can document why and how you violated the code and keep that so that if someone does decide to be okay. that person, that then you can submit that documentation to BACB because the one of the biggest problems with the old code prior to 2022 is that many of the, st of the code standards clash with one another, right? right? So you could be following one, but also breaking another. So I love that the flow chart with the, with the new code really allows BCBAs to be thoughtful in their decisions and not being like, okay, it's $11. If I take this, then I'm, you know, I'm violating that code. But then I also am ruining the relationship with the client because they accidentally bought an $11 one and then a $10 one. So you document that. Right. And then if someone like is going to be like that, if they're going to be that petty and submit some documentation to the to the BACB, you can support you can, you know, support your rationale and the BACB will accept that, which I really appreciate. I think the biggest thing you said, Jackie, is documentation. And I think that's as a BCBA, we all get so busy and we forget a lot of things and, you know, an ethical issue comes up and you may do the right thing and you may seek some guidance from somebody else and talk to somebody else about it, but then you don't write it down. You forget about it. And then three months go by, four months go by, and then something else happens. So that documentation piece is huge. And that's throughout the code. If you read, you know, every little, you know, section of the code, almost everyone says, and document and document, right. and document. <laughs> and we need to make sure we're doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Shannon, speaking of documentation, I, I can't remember if it was explicitly noted in terms of discussing systems, but I know looking at the, at the Gladowski article was so big on organizational, which I, I'm so glad that we got a chance to, to you know, we're going to get a chance to keep talking about this article. I get a chance to, you know, read this article because I'd missed this one. Certainly I read like the Valentino article from this before, but this yeah. is a newer one. And I just love the idea of, Hey, everybody, as much as you as an individual need to be really thinking about your ethical responsibility, if you work in a place that doesn't care at all about your ethics, it's going to be really hard, if not impossible, to actually yeah. perform ethical behavior in your work. So I really just love this idea of just, again, beating home the point of if you're an organization and you're not thinking about things like, what should the documentation look like? Could we give people documentation to keep track of ethical issues? Is it part of our ongoing system? Just to make it as easy as possible for people to behave ethically. But that would be one where I would love to be in a place where they're like, oh, yeah, did you have an ethical discussion? Great. Here's our ethical memo. Just jot down some things you did. And even anything like that would be so helpful for remembering I should, I got to write this down as opposed to, I think I did this. Maybe I did. I don't remember now. What's that ethical complaint against me? Ooh. Right. Yeah. Gludowski's article was really great. And I actually went back. I had read Valentino's before. I'd read Linda LeBlanc's before, but it was really great. And I actually did go back and brush up on those studies as well. I, I had Dr. LeBlanc as a university professor and she is wonderful awesome. and I continue to follow her. I go to conferences just to see her and I take yeah. online CEUs just to be near her. That's creepy, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, with that being said, you know, she was the first to document and talk about this decision-making process and putting this in a human service agency. And, uh, you know, then Valentino updated that with the new code and Valentino and LeBlanc worked closely together. And then Gladowski took it one step further and, you know, did that follow-up study. And I love it because all of these articles now are talking about this more and more and more. And I think the, the 
next step that needs to happen is this all sounds like these are from larger organizations. And how do we put this in place with a smaller organization? Mm -hmm. You know, we have members out there who are, you know, just setting up shop and, you know, they're a two person show or they're, you know, in a very small company right now. And I think the next step of these articles needs to be, how do we put some type of ethical model within a really tiny organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the size also makes me think of, I know Matt Broadhead and colleagues had an article about ethics, having an ethics coordinator, which I think might be hard if you don't have a lot of employees, but that almost feels like it might be a better fit or taking some of the lessons from LeBlanc and Valentino and Gladowski and then maybe just sort of condensing who's involved and in like getting the groups together to talk about ethics. Like, I wonder if that could be a solution. But again, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not in a small organization. I mean, I'm in a school system, so. People love it when I talk to them about my BCBA ethics code. I got like five other people who are like, oh, I know what that is. Everyone else sort of <laughs> like, thanks. <laughs> oh, all right. So now uh, that was my question. Let's get on to some of the how to ABA listener questions. And I I definitely love the lived in feel of all of these, all of these scenarios. <laughs> they feel very real, which then makes them a little scary to talk about because they're all ones that have happened, I think probably to all of us in, in some form or another. The first one, my employer asked me to increase hours with two of my clients. The clients could have used the extra hours, but I did not feel comfortable doing this because I did not have the time. My caseload was already very tight. What do you do? Now what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on. Next question. <laughs> I don't know. Let's skip that one. Can we skip that one? Just kidding. <laughs> I mean, it's tough, right? The code says that we have a responsibility to our clients, right? 3.01. Uh, of the code. And if you're an RBT, it's, you know, 3.12 of the RBT code is advocating for appropriate services for your client. But I think we need to define what the responsibility to our clients is. Sure, they may need more hours, but if you don't have the time to provide those hours or provide the appropriate supervision, what's the quality of those hours going to be like? And we need to look at that quality over quantity if we don't have that time. And I think that we really do need to go back to, you know, what are the examples of an effective BCBA? One of those is communication, being able to communicate with your employer and saying, I, I don't have the time to increase these hours. Is there another BCBA who can, you know, take one of these clients and I'll take the other client or help me out or something along those lines? Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of discussion amongst BCBAs about this caseload and, and everyone's asking about what should a typical caseload be? And and that's like kind of the first question I get asked when I interview people is about caseload. And I think it really depends what, like, it's hard to put a number on it sometimes. And sometimes it's, it's, it depends on like what's going on with the client or how many hours they're getting services for or what your responsibilities are. So I think it's more than just a number of two clients who need more hours. I think you have to look at the, the big picture. And sometimes it's even easier to take one client who needs more hours versus a whole new client because like it's much easier to supervise more hours with the same client. So I think it depends. And I do think that BCBAs shouldn't get too stuck with the caseload number and really think bigger in terms of like what's best for the client, what's best for sometimes the organization or, you know, it, there's more than just the number of cases. Mm -hmm. It also really depends on how experienced a BCBA is. I mean, you know, if you're doing an initial assessment, you know, I've I do initial assessments a lot, you know, and I can do them fairly quickly and accurately because I've been doing them for 20 years. You know, somebody who's been coming into the field and has six months of experience doing an assessment is going to take a lot longer to do that. And, you know, just to write up a whole initial program outline and everything else. So again, it really does, it, it is based on experience as well and how much you can do. But as you're taking on new clients, whether it's a new client, whether it's, you know, the code talks about supervisory volume, that's more of a supervisee versus supervisor. But, you know, anytime you're asked to take on anything new to your caseload, it's not just looking at like, okay, so there's two more billable hours or five more billable hours, but what are those non-billable hours, right? Because sometimes there's travel involved. Sometimes there's, you know, phone calls at night versus, you know, or emails to return that, you know, this person, you know, writes lengthy emails and always expects a response within, you know, a certain amount of time. And this happens, whereas you have other clients who, don't require that level of what's the word I'm looking for. They, they don't require that, that level of work 
or that that level of communication necessarily. You know, you put your two hours in and, you know, they're center-based and you want to talk to the client and or the stakeholder and the stakeholder doesn't even return your emails, right? Whereas another stakeholder might be very, very involved. So you have to factor that in as well when you're talking about taking on a new client or increasing hours. Mm-hmm. I don't, one thing that didn't didn't sound like was a challenge for the individual who asked this question, but I'm thinking about for folks who have lots of clients that sort of uh, are in these sort of weird amorphous roles as a BCBA, you know, what, what exactly is their role? So like 1.04, if they don't have a clear role or they're sort of overseeing a lot of aspects of a case, I think it could be really easy to find yourself in a situation where, yes, the client does need more hours because I guess I'm in charge of things that I didn't think I was in charge of, which is going to bring up issues related to competence, is going to bring up issues related to appropriate case load. So that could be another wrinkle in there of what what, what is actually your responsibility to the client? And is, does your boss disagree as to what your, what your responsibility is? Like, was that never well-defined and now you're sort of in the middle of the case? I really do think that university has to get better at teaching courses on communication. Mm-hmm. And having a you know, we have full courses on ethics, which is hugely needed, but having courses on literally communication, how to communicate with employers, how to communicate with your colleagues, how to communicate with stakeholders, because that is huge. And we just are, are supposed to just learn that on the job. You know, sure, if you have a really great supervisor, your supervisor is going to teach you, but that's not even required in the BACB task list. And if you are an effective communicator, to me, the very first thing I thought of when I read that question was, well, you go to your boss and you talk it out, but not everybody can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what, what's the good, let's, can we role play for a second? Cause I think my first thought when, when, you know, I think most of us, especially if we're having a bad day or it's the end of a day, you know, we're, we're at night and we were doing some traveling today. So we're all a little tired. So if someone said, Hey, you got to add more hours. I would have, I would be hard pressed until maybe tomorrow morning to say anything other than I got too much to do, which is not the same as explaining, well, here's my caseload. Here are my concerns. Here are the ethical codes. So, I mean, what, what, what might that look like if you were to go to your, to go to your supervisor, your boss, to explain the situation? Like, does anyone want to give it a shot? I I will. I mean, I I owned three clinics for a long time. And so I was the boss, but I was more than the boss. I was the boss. I was the BCBA. I hired another BCBA. I was the colleague. I was, I was a lot of different roles because I had to be. And, you know, people would come to me and I had a really great, we had, I had really great employees. They were fabulous, but we taught each other how to communicate. And one of my biggest pet peeves was when people would come to me as I'm on my way to do something else. So I'm on my way to go see a client or I'm, you know, taking a phone call or just got off the phone and someone's like, oh, hey, Shana, this. And I'm like, well, wait a second. So I think the very first step in effective communication is determining a time that is appropriate. So, you know, sending your employer an email or your supervisor, you know, saying, you know, hey, you know, when's a good time to talk and actually finding a time that works versus doing it on the fly. That is the very first thing, number one. Um, and number two, doing it alone. You know, you instead of, you know, them being with a group or in a big, you know, doing it one-to-one so that it can feel a little bit more private, a little bit more personal would be the biggest thing. And, and if you do those two things, I think the other things will come and you set yourself up for success. Oh, I like what? those. Those are those are prerequisite skills. I wasn't even thinking. I was like, well, what are the words? But no, you're right. Uh-huh. Quick right? email. Do it alone. Antecedent, probably going to be okay. <laughs> antecedent strategies here, Rob. <laughs> Please. Anyhow, I love those. Those are, the, those are the easiest ones. They work so well most of the time, too. That's really good advice. And I, I think having an ongoing rapport and opportunity to meet with your boss or whoever your supervising BCBA might be, if you're a new BCBA, is really critical. Because... Yeah, like in this scenario, it's just two extra hours, right? And so everyone, if, especially if you're new, you might not think about all those extra pieces that you were saying. And they say, oh, it's two more hours. I can do that. But until you you know, speak up and say, actually, I think I'm at my, my limit time-wise with what I can do and, and do a good job at, then you're just going to keep getting those requests of adding more and more little by little. So having that avenue of communication open and knowing that you can, you know, bring those things up to your boss is, is really important so that you can keep providing good quality care Mm -hmm. ethically. 
Yeah. And also from a a supervisor or manager, I, when I offer more hours to one of my PCBAs, it's genuinely not from a place of like, you need to take these hours. I don't know what their caseload is like. I don't know necessarily what they feel like they can take on more or not. I want to be able to offer it to them. So I think, you know, I'll have the ones who come back to me with thanks a lot, but my plate is full, totally fine. Have that open communication, but I wouldn't want them to come back like feeling like resentful that I offered it to them because you have to see it from, you know, both sides. And while one side is feeling burdened, I really just genuinely want to help them. So kind of just having that balance of communication is, is the best, the best solution. And it goes back to that Zayek article again, right? You know, what, what is an exemplary behavior analysis an effective communicator? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Now, what about the flip side? I'm assuming it was the same listener, but then asked, conversely, what if your employer wanted you to recommend more hours and time was no longer the issue? You have the time to supervise, but you didn't think it was medically necessary nor supported by uh, the assessments, by your FBA. So the pressure's on, get more hours, but you have no clinical reason, no database reason to add extra hours. The client's making effective progress, you know, for example. Mm -hmm. So we actually encounter this too often here Mm -hmm. in Canada because of the way the funding is and more, not so much how it is currently, but how it used to be where the BCBA was the business owner and the program director and the one recommending the hours for funding. And there's a huge conflict in that because I'm, I'm running the business. Why wouldn't I recommend the most amount of hours? And that used to be how hours were determined not the case anymore. Sure. It was, it was determined by, you know, does the owner need like an addition on their house or a new roof? Totally. And then the hours would come out there. Yeah, and it'll be granted based on, and you didn't even need much to back it up, you know, like there was no, you know, something about proving medical necessity. We didn't really have that. So they've changed that model to be one that is more, I would guess, parent supported. So parents can request the amount of hours and parents are getting the funding. And we do come up with this a lot because often parents will want more hours than we may think that the child needs or they may get more funding for hours than they need. And I actually think that like, it really depends on what the alternative is. I know we looked into like, what is, you know, medical necessity? How, what is that number of hours? I don't know if there's a magic number. We couldn't really find much on support on like the number of hours that are medically necessary. But I think this comes back to seeing the big picture and what's really going on that when this child isn't with you in a clinic or what does your clinic look like? For me, it's really just education. So if a kid is in education all day and we're calling that ABA or they do a couple extra hours of ABA after school, like it's not really harmful. We're doing what's in the best interest of the client. You're seeing the big picture. You're getting all stakeholders involved. So I'm not, I would think like, you know, if they're making progress and everyone's on board, like kind of the more the merrier, if it's in the right, the right kind of arrangement If it's like pulling the child out of school and they're not having socialization and there's all these other, you know, cons or downsides to to this, then you obviously have to consider that. But that was my thought on this. I think Shane may have had a different person. Her and I actually talked about this one for a while because we did have differing opinions. And, you know, for me, we have to advocate for our clients period. And that's what our code says is, you know, client, client, client. And, you know, there are certain aspects. I agree with Shira in the fact that, well, if the client's sitting around on an iPad and doing nothing, then being engaged with an ABA therapist is way better than doing nothing. But again, it depends the way in the insurance and everything works as well. Because if you're, you know, if you're putting in extra insurance hours, that's fraud. You can't do that. Uh, But if it's, you know, if you say, no, I think my client needs X amount of hours, making sure that you're basing that on data, documenting your decision, and if your employer still wants to go ahead and give more hours, then you have a duty to report, right? So you have to report that to the insurance company, to the BACB, and making sure that you document that you weren't in agreement with that. Within six months, too. Yeah. Right. If it's after six months, they may not accept it. Mm -hmm. So that's section 1.16 of the code, self-reporting critical information. I know that one. It'll be different in the States for you guys. In terms of the self-reporting insurance, it's, I think that was pretty similar. Yeah. No, not the code, not the code one, but question recommending hours. I mean, there's a lot of big insurance, big companies now, right. have taken over and it's more about billing than it is about the client. Well, some companies, right? How is it with all of you? 
Yeah, I mean, that does still happen. But I think the BCBA then has to, you know, advocate for their clients, demonstrate data, and then report as necessary, right? Mm. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. Hey, everybody. Sorry to pause the conversation, but I wanted to remind our listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE and Quaba approved. So by listening to this episode, you are able to earn one ethics CE. All you need to do is finish listening to our discussion with Shana and Shira, and then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, or click the link in your podcast notes section. Uh, You are going to need some key information about yourself, your certification number, and two code words that are sprinkled throughout the episode. Uh, these are guests, special guest code words from the How to ABA folks. I'm going to give you the first one right now. It is Ski Racer. S-K-I-R-A-C-E-R. You can make it one word or two. Ski Racer. Sure, that's fine. Someone who races. Yeah. Just have on your skis. Height, eye color, social security number, birthplace ready for us as well. But no, that's that's ridiculous. You don't need that information? Not that. I mean, you can leave it oh, if you wait. want. You can email us that stuff if you really want to. But we don't need that. <laughs> just some of the stuff you Maybe need. Maybe I should listen to this episode on ethics. I, you probably. Ski racer. All right, let's get back to the discussion. We've talked a lot about documentation. I think this is definitely an area where I feel more comfortable when I see that documentation. Uh, and some of it is, you know, ethically necessary, clinically necessary. You know, show me your behavior assessment. Oh. And I feel much more strongly when folks show me that they've done, you know, maybe an analog FA, they've done an ISCA, they've done something that really analyzed data rather than, oh, I did a fast, I asked a couple people, and uh, I watched a few times, it's probably this, therefore they need 40 hours a week. That doesn't feel very coherent. It feels like they've just slapped a number onto a sloppy assessment, or maybe it was a good assessment too, but you know, could it have been more thorough, right? It's not giving me the information I want. I think the more data people are sharing in terms of student progress, proposed programs, I think it makes it a lot easier to sort of semi-quantify, you know, if you are going to use these types of programs, you know, my evidence based, mostly based on my own experiences, those tend to take, you know, two to three hours. And depending on how much support they're getting at school, at home, in the community, you would do more, you would do less. And if you've documented all that, I think it's very, well, I don't want to say very easy, but I think it, it's, it's a lot more concrete to make a case of how much time is needed to meet these goals. Uh, so again, I think the more documentation, the more on, uh, you know, upfront we are with sharing that information. I mean, those are ethical requirements too, right? You know, are we explaining assessments in a way that all stakeholders understand what it is we're proposing and why? And if anyone has those questions, can you answer them? And if I say, you know, what, 40 seems a lot or 20 seems low or five seems low or five seems a lot, uh, how did you come up with that? And you can't give me a general sense of your math. I'm going to question whether or not you are really thinking about the client's best interests or some other factor. Again, that doesn't make it an ethical concern. That's just my personal concern. But I'd rather have no ethical concerns or personal concerns than, you know, hope that a personal concern doesn't turn into an ethical concern. Right. All right. We've got some scenarios here from, wow, some, some tough scenarios about working in client homes as well. So there's a couple examples here of folks sort of working in areas. I'm going to, I'll be a little more sort of vague with the details because I certainly don't want to, you know, us to give the impression that we're giving specific advice. If you see blank, you should do it, you know, something else. But 
If you are, let's say, an RBT or a BCBA, and you are working in a home where there are signs of safety, maybe it's health and wellness, maybe it's parents seeming impaired, maybe it's parents acting in ways that are different than the, their typical baseline, sort of signaling something might be wrong, whether it's something that, you know related to maybe an intoxication or an injury or home stressors that are just changing patterns of behavior, when do you pull the services? Or when do you, you know, say, I can't start the services? You know, when is it okay to tell a family, you got to clean up your act X, Y, and Z ways before I will give you services? Is it okay to do that? When is the safety of the RBT or BCBA paramount? When does that take precedence? How do we know it takes precedence? All good questions. <laughs> They're not mine. I just added that, you know, this, these, are, these are your listeners. This is a great question. I just, yeah, I, I added a, a couple more. I- Worked in home base for many, many years. So nothing, I didn't experience anything this extreme, but definitely experienced things where like you're feeling like a little, you know, icky about what's going on. And it's important to to ask these questions because it's not really a fine line or it's not like black and white. So I think that the, the best thing would be if you go into any service, especially a service at home where you have very clear parameters, and this is where service contracts, you kind of, at least for me, I'm kind of always learning what I need to add into my service contract as these situations come up. So I'm constantly tweaking it and adding to it. Oh, that's a good thing I need to put in there. I never would have thought of that. So your service contract ideally is, is you know, addressing a lot of these things, missed sessions, parents, you know, not being available or not being home or somebody does need to be home when they're getting services. All of these things would hopefully be addressed in the service contract, which means that you hopefully wouldn't start services if those weren't in place. And if services, you know, you have a probation period often with home, home-based services. And if they weren't meeting some of those service contracts, then, you know, you'd give them the notice or whatever is, is in the contract. That's when it's all, you know, nice and clean. Sometimes the things come up that aren't part of that service contract. And I think the most important thing is safety, safety for the child, safety for the professionals who are working there. And if you are, you know, suspicious that something might be unsafe, we have a responsibility to the clients and responsibility to our therapists to report it. I think in terms of like report, what's, what's the reporting? I mean, I assume in Canada, similar, you sort of have like a role of like mandated reporters, depending on yeah. human services. Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty clear child, rules. You have to report it in that way. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what it's called in the States. Yeah. Mandated reporters is. No, report it to who? Uh, oh, it depends. I mean, certainly if it's a legal issue, you report to the police or yeah. to other authorities. Um, it, and it, it's called different things in different States. Yeah. In our state, it's DCF. That's the, the group you would you yeah. would report to. Department of Children and Families. But it, everywhere it has a different name, yeah. of course. I really liked the phrasing that you used, which says, if a parent can compromise the safety of the RBT, then they can also compromise the safety of the child. Mm-hmm. So if anyone is concerned for anyone's safety, then it is likely that you should be reporting that situation. Mm. I also, as a as an RBT, you're working under a BCBA. That's You have to be working under a BCBA. So already you're a team. You're at least a team of two. So yeah. if there's anything off in a home, and I mean, I've done home therapy for years as well, and it can be really rewarding, but it can also be tough. You go into a whole bunch of different homes, you're seeing a whole bunch of different things, yeah. you know, cultural diversity, biases come into play. There's a lot of that as well. But if there's anything that you feel is just off, you can't define it. There's just your spidey senses are going off and you're okay. There's something odd about this situation. You don't know whether you should report or not. You know you have a duty to report, but you're not quite sure if it is a situation where you need to do that. You talk to your team, talk to your BCBA, talk to another person on your team about it first off. Secondly, then, you know, ask yourself, is it a safety issue? If it's a safety issue, 100%, you need to pick up that phone, you need to report. But if you've got a team, like I said, your your RBT, BCBA, employer, you know, have that conversation. And sometimes it might be a solution where it's it's not about the safety of a child, but it might be something that, you know, the, the parents just can't swing home therapy for whatever reason. And maybe it's just the solution is, hey, we can get therapy in a different environment. And that might be the solution. So there there might be other ways to do that, you know, in terms of your responsibility to the clients, you know, your client can still get therapy. It might just need to look a little bit more creative. 
Mm. And I think there's so many situations where like you were saying, it's not, you're not sure. And, and it does damage your relationship to a parent. If you do report that and like, you know, you shouldn't have like, that's going to not go well at all. So we do have to be careful about what we are reporting that it really does need to be a safety issue, but that doesn't mean there isn't a solution for when you're just not sure. There are people to ask, you know, there are hopefully, you know, you could refer them to, you know, our community has different like social work type people that can help. You could refer them to different agencies. You could, you know, get them to go to a center, any one of those things, and then collect the data, like document things, because one little thing might just make you feel a little suspicious. But if that's happening, like over and over and over again, you know, we look for trends. And that might be once you see it documented, a little bit more eye opening as to what the right next step is. Mm. I've actually called Children's Aid a few times and not specifically about a client, but about a question. Mm. So, you know, call them in general, like, hi, I'm just calling anonymously. This situation happened. Is this a duty to report? And sometimes they'll say, no, no, it's not, or do this instead. Or they'll say, yeah, yes, it is. And we can get some help for these people. And okay, and then I will report. But it's nice because you can call and just ask those questions. I actually went in with a parent one time and we actually, there was, you know, an office near that, near the parent's house. And uh, she had questions about her son staying home alone. And we wanted to teach this as an ABA program. Can he stay at home? And he had severe impairments and I didn't know the answer to that. So we literally walked into the office and the three of us, meaning the caseworker and, you know, me and the stakeholder talked it out and came up with all these parameters. You know, if you can teach the, you know, teach the person this, 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 and this, then yes. And if you can document that, then yes. But if not, so they were actually really helpful. And I think a lot of the time, you know, we think, oh, I can't be calling children's aid because, right. oh no. And that you can work with them and they're actually really amazing. That's, that's, that's good to know. Cause I, I think most that's folks, it. when they think about calling those, those numbers or those hotlines, it very much is, I have to tell on somebody, someone's going to get in big trouble, but is there room for information for gaining information and, and understanding of a situation better through, through those collaborative efforts? Oh, Oh boy, your listeners did not do not disappoint with some of these questions. We're gonna we're gonna move on to one of my least favorite least favorite in that I always find these to be very complicated myself, and they're very hard to extricate. And boy, if you thought that the ethical code was in line with say laws in your area about multiple relationships, no, not really. They're kind of all over the place. At least in Massachusetts, there's similarities, but there are differences. There's exceptions. So this is one that I. I, I, I see everyone, you know, str- widely struggle with, and I, I'm not surprised other people would be struggling with them. So again, I don't want to give ex- like two specific examples from some of your listeners, but some general patterns of multiple relationships, or as I'm not sure uh, whether it was one of you or one of the listeners, Linda LeBlanc quote, dual relationships where you least expect them. <laughs> Linda LeBlanc's article was just giving examples of some of the ethics talks that she did. And I thought it was one of them. I thought that was really great. I got really good. Cause that's right. It's not like I planned to have this happen. It's just right. it's suddenly appeared. All right. I'm picturing like Buzz Lightyear when he's like holding his arm out and he's like dual relationships, dual relationships everywhere. <laughs> to infinity and beyond. <laughs> yes, exactly. So th- there's uh, a couple, couple kind of dual relationships we're least expected. One is sort of the more standard, I think, Somebody I'm giving, I'm delivering services to somebody and they happen to provide a different service and either because I needed help with that service or because they were very adamant that they would help me with the service they provided. They did extra work for me pro bono. However, how do you demonstrate that that is not uh, because of the work you're doing with the family? So, you know, for example, if you work with a family that, say, has a restaurant, they're giving you a lot of free meals, right? Is that, you know, how do you get out of a multiple relationship or avoid getting into one? Uh, And then a follow up question was one actually from an RBT. What do you do if you're an RBT and your BCBA supervisor is not modeling maintaining mm. appropriate relationships and putting you in the odd situation where now you're the bad guy who won't play along? Which kind of sounds like a 70s cop movie where like all the cops are like dirty cops and like, oh, that guy's not on the take. Kind of reminds me of that situation. Starring Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> so, so how do you, what, what do you do? when you have families that are trying to be helpful 
and are getting you into a multiple relationship. Contracts, contracts, contracts. <laughs> yeah, and you would have heard all of these things, and they're in the contract. Right. No. So the BACB doesn't specifically prohibit bartering or trading goods for services. That was in the newsletter. So that was in a recent newsletter. They do not prohibit that. But they do say that it is not recommended, right, because you can't quantify quality of services, Right. But they do say that if you do that, you need to have a pretty straight, uh, pretty stringent contract in place. Hmm. And I think it's a little bit more straightforward when it's like service for service, both services end or whatever it is you're exchanging. You have a contract in place and like nothing really could come of it. You go to a restaurant, you eat the meal, like the chances of something coming back from that are, are pretty, pretty slim. You should still have the contract in place. And you always want to be thinking like 10 steps ahead, like what could possibly come, you know, arise out of this kind of situation. I think it gets a lot trickier when a dual relationship is someone that you are providing a service to like ABA or they become your client. That gets a lot stickier. And those are ones that I would stay further, further away from because, you know, 10 steps down the road, you cannot predict what that's going to look like or what kind of services the client's going to need or what kind of situations you're going to get in with a family member or with a coworker or with things that really would present real, you know, ethical issues. So I would stay away from those, you know, multiple relationships when it comes to servicing a client. And then, you know, like Jackie said, if it's something that's really just an exchange of services as a one-off having a contract in place, like, Maybe I, I doesn't it, it doesn't seem like such a big deal to me. Mm. I think it depends what those services are. You know, if it's like, okay, so and if you're paying for those services, so okay, hey, you're the I live in a small town and you're the only deal in town and I need to buy my I'm giving my I don't know, my tires through you because you're one of one of one service providers for tires, I need to go to you. You know, if you're one of twenty so barber. <laughs> like Barber, right? Like if you're one of 20 service providers for tires, you'd love to support your client. And if you're going to pay, then go to them. But if you're not going to pay and what happens if there's a problem with those tires, then that's where she was talking about. You've got to think six steps ahead or 10 steps ahead, because if there are issues with a haircut, no big deal. You look terrible for a while, but it grows back. But if there's issues with the tire and you keep having to go back and forth and back and forth, then that's an issue. Mm-hmm. And what about the RBT in this situation? So, you know, certainly I think it's, it's, it's one thing when you don't have the power in a, in a situation to know that an ethical situation has occurred and ethics have been broken or violated. But what do you do when you are counting on that person to continue supervising you? I mean, I guess you hope you're in an organization that has an ethics network that you can write in to the, you know, to the uh, ethics group and the ethics leader. They'll look at that. But is this a situation where you're just going to have to, you know, report to the BACB, have that uncomfortable talk and then just hope it doesn't result in some sort of, you know, bad relationship afterwards or I think before any reporting, especially in this situation, back to open communication, like have that conversation the same way we're having this conversation. We don't know what those factors are. Understand why the the BCBA made that decision. Maybe it's a small town. Maybe it was, you know, they paid for the services. Maybe there was something you don't understand, but approach it for the RBT. Approach it not like accusatory. No come to the BCBA with a tone of like, how dare you, you know, break this code, but like with some curiosity, like, I'm, you know, just wondering, I'm learning and here's this code and here's what happens. And I'd love to understand your reasoning for this. Hopefully they could come to a place where either the BCBA acknowledges that maybe they should have done something differently, or maybe the RBT understands why the BCBA made that decision. And they could both learn from there, right? The willingness to continue to grow as a BCBA was one of the top 10. Right. And we're not perfect. <laughs> so we can't, you know, we can't always make the right decision and, and understanding and learning from that is important. Mm. Oh, so let's do, I, I have one, one more kind of example of multiple relationship that sort of came up in, in some of the scenarios that have been brought up. And it's the what do I do when somebody on uh, somebody in our employee or another teammate is maintaining relationships with families that are no longer clients of the organization or potentially they're clients of the organization, but are no longer clients under the care of the BCBA or potentially the, the RBT or behavior therapist? Yes, 
That one comes up a lot. This is a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If this person is an RBT and they do have their ethical code to abide by, then I think that you would definitely bring it up. I would start again by bringing it up with the RBT and letting them know that here's what's going on. Maybe I don't have all the information. Maybe you can explain something. Maybe there's something going on that I don't understand. And having that conversation with them, if they're not an RBT, it gets a little bit trickier because they don't have any kind of code or anything. So I don't know that there's much you can do in that case. Jane, you know, what do you think? Well, I was going to say, if you have a contract, I don't know whether, you know, the, what the situation is, whether the client is a previous client and the RBT is a previous RBT of the organization or whether the client is still a current client. But if the client is still a current client, or even if they're not in your service contract, what does it say? Does it say that you can hire BC or RBTs from your organization, or is there a certain time period that needs to pass first? So going back to that initial service contract and looking at what's in there. And then like Shira said, you know, communication. And I feel like we keep going back to this. It's all about communication and documentation, but, you know, being able to have that open communication with the RBT and maybe with that client as well. And just saying, hey, and again, not an accusatory tone, but hey, I understand that this is happening. What's the backstory on this? You know, is there something that that we're doing that we're that, that you don't trust us on and that's why you're seeking help or how how can we improve the situation so that you come to me and not to that old RBT? I like that. That's yeah. I'm gonna use that. I, I've certainly had plenty of those not exactly that, horror stories, but I've I've had a lot of those reports working in schools for many, many years of folks who sort of don't quite understand what their position is, their role with the family past a certain point is. And, and it, is, it wasn't just maintaining like contact with the family. It was providing advice to the family mm-hmm. on current behavioral objectives and programming. We think, I think that's right? one of those, you know, this person says that person says. Cause that's when it starts too. getting yeah. super ethically treacherous, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would say. So just to add that piece of, clarification. Yeah, but finding out the there. backstory on that, I'm not excusing that because the RBT should not be offering advice. And that is, a key. I would be reporting that to the board if I'm hearing that after I have a conversation with the RBT. Mm-hmm. But it's finding out from the family why they feel like they need to get that advice from the RBT. Like, am I not doing my job appropriately? And how can I improve? And how can I become a more effective behavior analyst? What do you want to see from me? Because it sounds to me like you trust the RBT more than you trust me. And I wouldn't say that in an accusatory way at all, but I need to find out what I can be doing better. Yeah. I think one one thing that also would add a wrinkle to it, what if it is a long period of time after there was a working relationship and maybe that BT or RBT sort of, oh, they found me on Facebook or I, I saw them post something and we sort of just touched base and it had been a long time. It, you know, we, we just became friends unrelated to the service, which was maybe years and years ago. They might not know enough to say this is not this is me being a friend versus this is me giving professional advice. They might not even know I should have reported this relationship because it's been a long time. Or the RBT might not even be an RBT anymore. <laughs> there's nothing to report. Yeah. 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 Those are the tricky ones when there's something to report, but there's actually nothing to report at the same time. Ugh. Right. But if they are now a BCBA, then they should not be providing advice to yes. non-clients. That would be an easier conversation yeah, to have, yes. I hope. All right. I think this is going to be kind of our last our last question. I'm going to sort of uh, lump a couple together again into into kind of a, a a little bit of a broader a broader category. But what should one do when they are uh, kind of privy to you know they're they're a member of a team or they serve a role and they're privy to somebody else in that group doing something that is in their opinion inappropriate, unethical, not clinically indicated. So, for example, some of the examples your listeners gave, what if you are serving not as a BCBA in a situation, but you're serving as a teacher and you are not happy with what the BCBA is doing? However, it's not your role to be the BCBA for that client. Or you are part of a parent teaching group and a parent is uh, really spending a lot of time trying to discuss pseudoscientific or anti-scientific procedures as a part of the group. Yeah, the, these were, I mean, we also discussed these a bit because they were tricky. I don't know, I, I don't know what the right answer is, to be honest, but I think it, it depends on really what's going on, all those other factors. Are you 
Are you also a BCBA? Do you have that background? What is your relationship to the family in this situation? Sometimes you you can, would it really be your place to ask the BCBA questions, confront them directly before telling the family what's going on? Just ask, maybe there's parts you don't understand. If it's really a safety concern, you know, if they're doing things during the day that are unsafe for the child, then don't bother asking the questions and you really should tell the family because then it becomes, you know, a duty to report. Um, so I think, I think it depends really what's going on and start with, if it's, everything is safe, I would start with communication again. Um, but staying away from that dual relationship because it could get so tricky. Mm -hmm. In the case of, you know, say, for instance, you're conducting a parent workshop or, you know, you're doing some parent coaching and, you know, parents are adamant in terms of, you know, hey, I read something uh, in this newspaper article. Who reads the newspaper anymore? But, you know, I watched the news on this. I saw this on social media and I really want to try this. You know, I think we need to really look at the perspective of our parents. And I think as BCBAs, we don't do that enough. So put ourselves in parent shoes. And if you are a parent in this situation, I mean, I am a parent. I'm not a, you know, I, I'm a parent, but, and I, I don't lead my child's life from a BCBA role. I lead my child's life from a, I'm a parent. And I think about what if, right? Like if I was a parent and I didn't do this, would I always look back and say, what if, right? Our job as a BCBA is not to go, yeah, yeah, just go out and do that. Absolutely. And go and do this. Our job as a BCBA is to educate our parents on effective treatments and what's clinically appropriate and to be able to say, okay, you know, I don't know enough about this, but here's what you need to look out for. Research this, 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 and this. So make them, you know, look at you're not necessarily saying, you know, don't do that, but you are opening their eyes to saying, you know, this might not be the right approach or this isn't, you know, effective or there's no data to support this. But as a BCBA, you can't necessarily go out and tell a parent that right off the hop because a parent's going to get their back up. It's that relationship. But if you can tell them, well, you know what, look for this, 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 and this, you know, and if all else fails, make sure I can help you with a baseline. Let's take baseline data right now. And then let's take baseline data, or not baseline, but let's take baseline data right now. And then if you are going to do this, let's take continued behavior data throughout. And what are we, what are you trying to achieve? What is your end goal by introducing whatever you're going to be introducing, let's measure to see if that's working and let's keep touching base on that. Mm -hmm. And as a BCBA, that's really what you uh, need to be doing is, you know, you need to be advocating for your clients and you yourself needs to be providing effective treatment. But if a parent wants to go out and, re and, and do, all this other uh, do all these other things because they need to tick these boxes of what if, you can be there on the sidelines to support and to try and, si try and support with data. Mm -hmm. I was actually reading an article recently about humble behaviorism, which I thought, you know, connects to this because so, so often yeah. we hear about knocking down things that aren't evidence-based. It's not evidence-based. So like, we're just going to tell families not to do it. And this article talked about how we have to be a little bit more open-minded. We don't own the principles of behavior. And so when these kind of things come up, really exactly what Shana was saying is instead of like knocking it down, thinking about what, what's the value to the family, asking questions, trying to understand it, and then having data and documentation. And I think that that goes along with kind of, you know, full circle, what you said at the beginning in terms of qualities of a good behavior analyst, which is collaborative and it is humility. And it is all these things that when we do come up up with these ethical scenarios, still incorporating these qualities that we're not coming across as like, we report everybody and nothing is evidence-based and everything is black and white. And, you know, and sometimes we kind of jump the gun with, with a lot of those things. Mm. Yeah. That humble behaviorism article is really, really good. It's Kirby et al. I think 2022. And then the other one that I would highly recommend in terms of this convo is Broadhead et al. 2015, where they lay out an awesome flow chart that will help you assess non-behavioral treatments and determine if there is a safe, basically a safety need to intervene on behalf of the client and otherwise to, you know, assist everyone in, in seeing what the potential merits or limitations of a non-behavioral treatment might be. Mm. All right. Well, we 
could probably, I, I mean, I, I don't think there was a single one of these where I was just enjoying hearing everyone, but it just made me think of more codes. Like, should we bring up that code? What, what about when that code would be relevant? So, of course, as with any ethics discussion, it's not like there's a, and that was the one ethics answer. And if you do that, it'll be fine. And anything else is bad. No, nope. there's a lot of gray. There are a lot of pieces in play. But let's move into dissemination station to kind of wrap up and talk about some steps we can take as behavior analysts to sort of generally prepare for ethical situations in our lives and in the future. Uh, so Shana and, and Shira, I'd love to start uh, with, with both of you. I think, you know, we talked about a couple key points in terms of how to promote ethical behavior long-term for, for individuals. But if you sort of had to pick one skill, I know there are multiple skills, so it's not a fair question in some ways, but if you had to pick one that you would recommend if folks want to get ahead of ethical quandaries in the future, they should probably practice. I think we've said it. Communication. Good uh-huh. communication was the theme. <laughs> and what, what and can, anything else? Like what would be the second one? They're, they're great at communication. They're, they're not worried about that. They want a second one. Reading the code. That would be, I'd say, know the yeah. code, like read know it, the code. And the, know the code, know the flow chart, know the principles that we should be following those four principles that guide the code and just have it handy. And have somewhere to go if you don't know, you know, yeah. like that's what people are for. That's what we're for. That's what your colleagues are for. And so you don't have to figure it out all on your own. So like have people. Call a friend. John Bailey has an ABA hotline, an ABA ethics hotline. I've used it before. He is phenomenal. He called me himself within 24 hours and it was phenomenal. Use it. You know, talk to somebody if you really don't know the answer. And there is no answer. I think that's the other key thing is, unfortunately, there is no black and white here. There is no correct answer. Yep, I got that one right. So it is really helpful to be effective in communicating and to be able to call a friend. That was going to be my ad as well, is that we want to have open lines of communication and with that support for new BCBAs. So the Gladowski article and then the Cox article and the LeBlanc article that came before it are all speaking to how you can develop these ethic sort of support networks within your organization. And there, those are some great models for folks if they want to be looking at how they can do this to better support their new BCBAs. Cause there's so much decision-making, right? Have you, have you guys heard the thing where it's like, as a, as a, I don't know, as a, as a person, you make like 30,000 decisions or something every day. And some of them are not really very meaningful, but they still require brain power. And so that's why even if, at the end of a day, you're tired from just living your day because you've expended energy in doing these things. And then folks who are teachers are doing that like tenfold or something because they're busy mo- monitoring little lives, right? And so I think being an RBT and a BCBA has that same additional level of decision making on the fly that has to occur. And that's really stressful. So the more you can have that support system and feel prepared in making those decisions, the easier the transition into being a BCBA is going to be. And I would say uh, to anyone listening to this and and folks in the the How to ABA community, I think we discussed some really great questions. Thank you for for sending them in. And Shana and Shira, thank you for bringing them to us. If you are on the lookout for a job and you're wondering, is this an organization that values ethics? Maybe bring up some of these questions as, you know, I worked at a place where blank happened. Maybe that's not 100% true, but situations like this could happen. How would you handle them here? And if you get a lot of, that's a great question, something like that would never happen here, ooh, hit the, hit the door. That, that place probably doesn't have what you're looking for in maintaining, setting up these systems to maintain your own ethical behavior. <laughs> so we're just like a big family. Yeah, <laughs> that never happens here. We're all very ethical. <laughs> like, mm, that's not what I ask. Oh, boy. Well, Shana, Shana and Shira from How to ABA, thank you so very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much to your listeners, too, for coming up with such really thought-provoking ethical questions that we could discuss tonight. I, I've increasingly enjoyed talking about ethics as I get older. I used to hate it so very much because it was very complicated and there was no one right answer. But 
over time, it has become very exciting to get to have these discussions and have some dis- minor disagreements and, you know, w- review of some of the steps we need to take and moving the focus away from good versus bad and more of the harm, no harm steps to take, steps that you might not need to take, and, and really thinking about these situations as very complex, just like most human behavior. So uh, we, we thank you so much for your time. If folks want to check out uh, how to ABA, listen to the show, where should they where should they go? Or if they have extra scenarios they want to throw your way because they liked hearing your discussions tonight. So they can check on our website, howtoaba.com. And from there, you can visit our podcast, our blog. And if you have live questions, become a member to join our mentorship community. Excellent. Cool. And we'll have a link. We'll have a link too in the notes, folks. Yeah. So if you don't remember, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great name. I, you should be able to remember to type it in, but just in case you had a link in the notes, <laughs> cut down you. the response effort. <laughs> Thank you for having us. This was a great conversation. It's always good to keep this top of mind. So it's a good reminder for us too. And I really enjoyed. It was Thanks really for fun. coming. This is super you. fun. Thank you. Thanks once again to Shana Gaunt and Shira Carpel from How to ABA. And thanks to their listeners for uh, coming up with such great scenarios. Thanks to them for their great points on what to do in some of those situations, those key keys of communication, having good systems in place, all very Being important. all around excellent. Just being all around. No, you don't need to be all around excellent to be ethical. It helps. But you don't need to be doing that. You can focus on a few areas at a time to be exemplary. And we did not mention it. never stop learning. We didn't mention it. We did mention never stop learning. We didn't mention being ethical was considered one of the most likely to be rated exemplary uh, tasks. So being ethical is important, if only just because you want everyone to think you're the coolest BCBA in town. We want to make sure you get that second secret code word. It is membership. M-E-M-B-E-R-S-H-I-P. You are a member. You joined the membership of Ethical BCBAs. On the good ship. Membership. Yep. That's, that's, that yeah. works too. Very nice. And let's move on to our last section of the show, pairings. Hey, hooray. It's time for pairings. In pairings, I let you know about other past episodes of ABA Inside Track that you might want to check out if you found this one compelling. And... Goody for you. There's a bunch of them that are, many of them are ethics CEUs as well. If that floats your boat, they include two episodes that we've done with Dr. Darren Shush talking about ethics. We call them our ethics grab bag. One ethics and mailbag. Ethics mailbag. <laughs> what do we call it? We call it our ethics mailbags. That's episodes 105 and 203. You can check those out. Also, you can check out episode 200 where we talk about ethical decision making with Dr. Matthew Broadhead. You could listen to episode 52, You Need an Ethics Coordinator. You could also listen to episode 244, where we talked about moving from ABA student to ABA practitioner. That was with Kia Lyons and the Babbitt Student Group. And finally, episode 278, which is a two-hour episode where we discuss the Ethics Book Club with Linda LeBlanc and Amanda Carson. I also like to recommend a snack to go with these episodes if you're so inclined. And today, those snacks are going to have some Canadian flavor to them. So I'm going to recommend poutine, which I love and Jackie loves as well. This is not the first time you've recommended poutine on pairings, I think, Diane. Uh, it's okay. You can repeat them oh, okay. for this. It's not like code words. Okay. They can repeat. And also, that those delicious like maple candies, mm. those are good. Mm. Pairings. Very nice. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed our episode of ABA Inside Track. If you did, please subscribe to the show. You can also find us online at abainsidetrack.com where you can find links to all of the episodes we've done as well as a place to purchase CEs. If you want more ABA Inside Track content uh, as soon as it is released, you can uh, support us also on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track where you can subscribe uh, for free and get episodes a week ahead of time, or you can subscribe at the three, five, 10 or $20 levels to get additional bonuses, including a chance to vote on our quarterly listener choice episodes to get free CEs for listener choice and book club episodes, which is a lot of CEs per year, just saying, uh, and also a chance to vote on our book club episodes and to get those episodes right when they come out. Some folks have to wait a whole year for those book clubs, but not you, the patron patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. 
Well, we also want to give a couple other thanks. Certainly, once again, thank you to Shana and Shira from How To ABA. We also want to thank Dr. Jim Carr for his playing of our theme song, our friend Kyle Sturry for his interstitial music, and Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his amazing editing work. We'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye!